Today I want to approach this subject in a whole new way. We know that no man can know the day nor the hour of Christ's second coming. We also know that we are supposed to look for the day of his coming. So this isn't meant to be an attempt to guess the date of the second coming. You all know I'm not into that. But I think many will find this interesting as a thought exercise and approach to thinking about gospel learning and specifically today, the second coming. Some people approach scripture study like a puzzle, looking for the missing pieces. That is great. However, I find myself more often studying the scriptures like it is a Sudoku game. See, in Sudoku, you can use known numbers to fill in the empty boxes. By having a knowledge of certain gospel principles, when you find a gap or an empty space, you can use what you know to figure out what it must be, even if it's difficult or impossible to find in scriptures. Just like in Sudoku, by analyzing the numbers that exist in this square or on this row, you can determine that this cell needs to be a 4. Let me give you an example. I did a video on the 10 plagues of Egypt and how they will mirror the calamities near the second coming. You know water turned to blood, you know that there were frogs, then lice, then flies, etc. You can then research what would cause these things and many have theorized volcano ash from the Santorini eruption could have been the prelude to those 10 plagues. Now I'm not saying God didn't perform those miracles with Moses. In fact, I think it is even cooler that God in his foresight puts together a volcanic eruption to facilitate the plagues in perfect synchronicity with the children of Israel. But you can see how having an empty cell can get filled in because around it has many data points that you can use to derive the answer. So in this video, we are going to work on a very difficult gospel Sudoku puzzle together that I have not yet solved, and in fact, may be unsolvable right now. And if nothing else, I hope it will stimulate your thinking. By the way, the easiest way to access my other videos, as well as videos from way better teachers than me in the gospel, is to download and use the free gospel learning app. You can search on thousands of topics and get the best teachers giving you lessons on those subjects. It is also great for teaching classes at church and studying the gospel together as family and friends. Many people have reached out and asked how they can help support the new gospel learning app and gospellearning.org website. Donations have made gospel learning a reality, and we have set up a Patreon page for those that want to donate some money to help keep the project going. You can get the link below or in the description or from the donate menu in the app. Now let's get back to our gospel Sudoku puzzle. Oftentimes I find those empty Sudoku cells when two things that I think I know conflict, whereby something is wrong. For example, in the church we generally believe that there are seven dispensations of the gospel, each being about 1,000 years long. This pattern matches the creation of seven days, or periods of time, and on the seventh day God rested, and on the seventh dispensation of the world will be the millennium, which will be a period of rest. 2 Peter 3.8 says that one day to the Lord is a thousand years to man. We all believe this without question, and it makes perfect sense, right? This is confirmed with seven seals, seven trumps, and many other sevens. And it works out perfect, right? The fall of Adam is about 4,000 B.C., Noah about 3,000 B.C., Abraham about 2,000 B.C., King David about 1,000 B.C., and Christ at zero. The great apostasy is going on during 1080, and the millennium should start at about 2080 and goes for 1,000 years to 3080. Then Satan is loosed for a little season, and we wrap up the whole thing, right? Here is the problem. Moses 7.46 says, quote, Man of holiness is his name, and the name of his only begotten is the Son of Man, even Jesus Christ, a righteous judge, who shall come in the meridian of time. There are many verses which declare that Christ will come in the meridian of time. I'm sure you've heard many of them. What is a meridian? Well, on the earth, the prime meridian is the imaginary longitude line that separates the western hemisphere from the eastern hemisphere into two equal halves. We speak of the hours before noon as ante-meridian or a.m. and those afternoon as post-meridian, p.m., Thus, in a historical and religious context, the years and the centuries of human history are divided by the great event of the birth of Jesus Christ. The years preceding that epoch-making occurrence are now designated as the time before Christ, or B.C., while subsequent years are each specified as a certain, quote, year of our Lord, or as the Latin tongue, Anno Domini, 
AD. Thus, the world's chronology has been adjusted and systematized with references to the time of the Savior's verse. And this method of reckoning is used among all Christian nations. And we don't have to worry about mistranslation here because all of these verses come from modern day scripture. So with all that, have you seen the problem yet? If Christ was born in the meridian of time, and we know that there were 4,000 years prior to his birth, that would indicate that there will be 4,000 years after his birth. That is 8,000 years in total rather than 7,000 years. This is the Sudoku blank space we need to fill in. For those of you who might think that the quick answer is that we lost track of years in the Old Testament, that is unlikely, as the Bible is absolutely a genealogy, with exactly how long people lived and how old they were when they had children, etc. So this doesn't seem to be the right answer to me. Perhaps there needs to be 4,000 years of history after the birth of Christ, just like there were 4,000 years prior to his birth. But how can that be reconciled? Let's fill in our hypothetical Sudoku spaces as best we can. We have Christ's birth, and then let's assume for this mental exercise that the earth becomes celestialized at 4000 AD. What else do we know? We know that there has been a great apostasy until 1820. We also know that there will be a thousand year millennium. We know that we are currently in the dispensation of the fullness of times, which has gone from 1820 until today. Many are anxiously awaiting the event of the second coming, where Christ will return in glory just prior to the millennium. We also know that after the millennium, Satan will be released for a little season, but we don't know exactly how long that will be, leaving the open space of how long it will be between now and the second coming. From a Sudoku standpoint, this is really compelling because the only two selections we don't have specific dates for is the period that we are in now until the second coming and the little season that Satan is released after the millennium. And theoretically, if this meridian of time thing really does mean that we have 8,000 years, if we could figure out one, we will know the other, and we could attempt at a guess at the second coming. So how much time are we talking about in these unknown portions? Well, if we take 4,000 years after Christ's birth until the earth is celestialized and subtract 2022, the year this video is made, and another 1,000 years for the millennium, we have 978 years that belong between the little season after the millennium and the time from now until the second coming. That is a lot of years. So is there a way to figure out how long a little season may be? The term a little season is found in a handful of scriptures, but only Revelation 20 verse 3 talks about Satan being loosed for a little season post-millennium. Most of the other scriptures talk about another time referring to the redemption of Zion, which is our period now, beginning in the early church through the time Christ comes. There are a few other instances in the Doctrine and Covenants, but are referring to very short periods of time in early church history. Revelation 6, 9-11 is the final verse that refers to a little season. It says, quote, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren, that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. So John, who is getting this revelation, is seeing the early apostles asking how long it will be before Christ comes in judgment, and he says they need to wait a little season. So a little season can be a short period of time, or in this case, over 2,000 years. So that isn't helpful in determining how long either of these two periods will be. Plus, both unknown periods are identified as, quote, a little season in Scripture. The period we are currently in began in the early 1830s, so we are already almost 200 years into this little season. How much longer can it go? I doubt that the two periods are the same amount of time, but if they were, and we started from 1832 when that revelation was given, each of the two seasons would be 584 years, and we would be expecting the second coming in the year 2416. Now, to be clear, I don't think that they are the same amount of time, but this just illustrates how long these periods of time could be. Well, all we can do is look at some of the remaining events that that we know need to happen prior to the second coming and try to get a sense if that is a long period of time or a short period of time. 
In my experience, some people try to guess the exact date or the year the second coming will happen, almost like it's fantasy football. But even those that don't, in my experience, seem to have a sense as to whether they feel the second coming is close or whether the second coming is a long way off. It is also interesting that no matter what evidence you show one way or the other, people get entrenched in their belief. And if they think the second coming is very soon, there is nothing you can do to sway them. But whether you are one that believes that the second coming is near or far, we should be able to agree on a list of events that scripture tells us must happen prior. Here is a list of some of the events that I believe must occur before the second coming. This is not an exhaustive list, as I did these off the top of my head, and I excluded milestone events such as Christ's various appearances prior to him coming in glory. I'm trying to list events that will take some time, and yes, I realize that some of these can happen at the same time. Most of these, we don't have any idea how long they will be, but many of these are not measured in days, weeks, or even months. Based on your preconceived notions about the length of time until the second coming, I don't know if this makes you feel it's longer or shorter than previously thought. Also, remember that even if there are only 7,000 years rather than 8,000 years, and the Lord's use of the word meridian is arbitrary, which seems to never be for him, all of the things on this list and many more still need to happen prior to the Lord's second coming in glory. But for many, it may seem longer, and if so, it might explain more about the allegory of the olive tree found in Jacob 5, where time and time again the Lord wants to burn the vineyard, but the servant keeps talking him out of it, and try to save more and more good fruit before the vineyard is burned. To understand some of these events in more detail, I've created a bunch of videos on these and many other subjects. The best way to watch them is by downloading and using the free Gospel Learning app, and you don't even have to deal with any ads. There are also learning tracks available on subjects such as The Second Coming, which takes the very best videos and puts them into a series of videos that you can watch straight through. Why is it that every generation believes that theirs is the final one before the great and dreadful day of the Lord? I mean, this was true during the life of Christ, the early church in this dispensation, and even more so now. I believe God doesn't tell us when he will return because if it is too distant, our natural tendencies may be to procrastinate. So the Lord allows us to feel a sense of urgency in each generation, which in his infinite wisdom I am sure is a good thing. I hear some people say such things as it can happen really quick because we can just throw up a tent and dedicate it as a temple, or that prophecy probably doesn't mean that the temple has to be in that exact spot, or maybe the silence in the heavens for 30 minutes really is just 30 minutes. All I can say is there aren't many examples in scriptures where the Lord is in a rush, and he never does things half measured, and never does he not fulfill all prophecy. So while we still don't know the timing of the second coming, I hope I gave you some things to think about and an approach to studying gospel topics such as these. At least that is one of the ways that I do it. Thanks for watching.